ourselves with us today we have four three fantastic panelists i was about to add myself to the conversation but i am also fantastic that notwithstanding and uh, i would like to invite each of our panelists to just share with us who they are and what they do as we bring this conversation to our people masi you did open us open for us with a word of prayer and so i would like to speak to the gentlemen in the room starting with our legal uh, officer for the how are you so close uh my name is agoy polika i'm an advocate commissioner of oath and a certified professional mediator i practice at agoy kilima and company advocates uh we are located at view park towers 19th floor suit 19 uh we deal with legal issues uh on our day-to-day -day, uh engagements and that's what i do all right thank you thank you so much for sharing that polycap uh with us we also have joseph hi joseph how are you hello Karafa. i'm doing very well so just to introduce myself my name is joseph Wariro. i'm a talent and change consultant so I'm a certified change manager and also a certified coach. I'm currently working at Seed Africa Group Limited, and I'm happy to be in this conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joseph. And I hope to hear more about what uh, talent and change uh, has to do with this conversation. But particularly, I like the, the fact that you can coach and consult people as they're going through various stages within uh, their change. And also with us is none other than Masi. Masi, how are you? I'm very fine, Karafa. My name is Marcy Momoi Koipitat. I work for the Insurance Regulatory Authority in charge of supervision and regulation of all the insurance intermediaries in Kenya. I have a passion for insurance and I'm a CEO to be for a foundation of young mothers. And I can't wait to be part of this conversation. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcy, for that. And I hope uh, to see you blossom into. Uh, the space that you're looking at and today's conversation as you can see we have various professionals from different spaces but one thing that brings them all together is that they are members of the lapid crossroads community and so the lapid crossroads program is designed for professionals who have over five years of experience and they're looking to expand their leadership uh, capacity to be able to take on more responsibility and to effectively lead teams uh, just to start off, uh, maybe Polika, a go you can share with us what was the greatest takeaway from your time in the Lapid Crystal program? Uh, my great takeaway was actually everything that was trained there. To me, it was enlightening. Each and every session and each and every uh, time I took uh, the materials that you were given to read, I could always take away something all the way from uh, uh, the first session which was about that the world is hiring and going forward to other topics such that uh, system thinking entrepreneurship mental models both of them opened up my mind to two uh, two various uh things that i didn't know about but most importantly the one that i took about it was about productivity and time management and i think it's one of the issues that i was facing uh, at the time and I'm very happy for the progress I've made uh, up to now. So that was my biggest take. All right, thank you, Polika, productivity and time management. I'll circle back to that as we're looking into today's topic. Joseph, uh, you're part of the second cohort of the Crossroads program. How would you say, uh, what would you say was a great take out? Thank you so much, Karafa. So um, my greatest take out of, from the Crossroads program was a session on mindsets and change. I got to learn how for change to happen, it has to start in the mind. It has to start in the mind path so that it now can happen. So I think that was a very important thing because I've noticed it in my life, in my workplace, that for any change to happen, I first have to make the mental shift for that to happen. That was my greatest takeout. All right, mindset and change, mental shift to make things happen. I like that. And also I believe you'll be speaking more uh, into that in today's conversation, Marcy, you're part of the current uh, cohort of the Crossroads program. So far, I believe you're also having a fantastic time 
are in the program. What would you say is also your greatest takeout so far? First, I will start by saying, I think this is the greatest thing that I have come across this year. It has really changed me as a person. My greatest takeout has been on understanding the self-awareness, personal mastery, growth and change, like Polika talked about. I do not navigate with fear anymore. I understand myself, I know my strength, and I'm ready to face the world. Understanding yourself and being ready to face the world. I like that. Yes. And, and I hope that we'll be looking we'll be looking at how you'll be able to leverage on that uh, to bring out the best version of yourself and particularly looking to drive change within the communities that you work with. And today's conversation is around how do we drive sustainable change, particularly by using a innovative leadership approach. We live in a world that is volatile, uncertain, ambiguous, and very complex. And in business, we like to know how are we able to push through this particular space to be able to achieve the best results. And so today we'll be looking at how are we going to, what are the tools that we can, tools and techniques that we can use to not only generate and implement ideas, but also to manage the innovation process and encourage attitudes that would rather foster than undermine the new thinking. Sustainable innovation requires the right tool set the right skill set and also the right mindset. And so we will be looking at today's conversation in these three areas. And to start us off, Marcy, you understand that innovation is the lifeblood of any organization. You operate within the insurance space and looking at it even uh, within the community that we have here in Africa, which is also marked by the VUCA principles. We understand that it's not just about generating ideas, but also how do we effectively implement them to be able to drive this successful change. And so from your end, what would you say are some of the essential tools and techniques that someone can use to drive innovation? First of all, I like the fact that you're using the VUCA world because the first time I, cross, I came across that term, I was so intrigued to know what it meant. So, and then I had to understand that it's the acronym of vulnerable and certainty, complexity and ambiguity. And I wanted to understand more why the VUCA world. So I came to know that it was defined by the US military. When they used to fight, they, they came across and I had various thoughts and they thought this warfare environment is not the same as we used to have. So they had to empower their soldiers to come up with the different skills for them to handle. The same way the business world is. And so many organizations have taken up this perspective. And they, they understand that for a business to thrive, you don't have to use the same way of thinking that you've applied in the past sense. You have to have a growth mindset, think of new things. The world is changing and it's changing in a way, it's volatile, it's changing very fast. It's uncertain, you can't predict the changes that are happening. It's complex, there are more ideas that you need to check into and it's ambiguous, it can't be defined. So that is why we hear of the world innovation in very many organizations. Innovation, innovation, but what really, Karafa, what really is this innovation? I think when we mention the word innovation, most people will relate it to technology, but is it really that? And others will relate it to coming up with ideas, but is it really that? For me, I believe innovation has more to do with coming up with ideas and implementing them to solve real world problems through the organizations that we work. And so today I'm so happy to talk about the tools and techniques that we can employ in this industry. Rather, all the industries, all organizations can use to drive a change. And so I would like to talk about two things that I've been thinking a lot about them. One is the intrapreneurship concept, and the second one is the design thinking. So what really is intrapreneurship? I didn't say entrepreneurship, I said intra. Entrepreneurship then, if I try and relate it with the real terms, is entrepreneurship in the existing organizations. All of us are employees. We work for different organizations. For instance, I work in the insurance sector. I have a pay, I have a responsibility to do for IRA. But what is it that I can be allowed to think like a business owner, come up with ideas, skills that will help the organization 
face its goals and at the same time bring a change to the society. So entrepreneurship allows employees to come up with perfect ideas, but even as you're coming up with these ideas, you know, then it's, you're working for an organization and you have to pitch your ideas towards them and they have to make sense because you can discuss first with your peers and then reach your superiors, your supervisors, go now to the higher level. This, this, this are, there is no cost because yours is only ideas, but it's the organizations that are supporting this. And it has to be something that is tangible and is adding value. So with entrepreneurship, which I know most of us has tried, then I know so many people, this is what usually happen in the market nowadays, People are so driven by AI, technology is coming up, and then you tend to look at it from the perspective of an expert. You say, I'm an insurance expert. This is technology. I'm thinking of, for my case, I'm in the insurance sector. I'm thinking of products, and all in all, I, I come up with ideas, I develop products, and I want to pitch them off. But I think the mistake we make is that we do not really analyze for me to be innovative, for me to drive that change. Are these products that I'm coming up with really solving the problem? And now there comes my point of design thinking. I'm sure if you're in the business world or whichever organization you work for, you have come along this term, but what really is design thinking? There are so many processes that you can use to face the innovation and to approach the innovation, but I would prefer design thinking because design thinking is an, an approach that comes from the human perspective. It's a combination of philosophy and necessary tools that can help you be creative when you're coming up with those solutions to face the world. So design thinking is like taking a human lens and try to view it, view the problems from a human lens. So it has very many processes and uh, maybe I can like to define more about it. about it. The first process is empathize. Look at me in my situation, insurance sector. Insurance penetration has been at 3% for a very long time. Maybe I blame Africans, maybe we blame ourselves, but Africans don't look at insurance as something that is a basic tool. Yeah, what are we going to do to change this 3% narrative? So look at it this way, you have to empathize. So when you come to the first step of empathize, then it means you have to really look, Dennis, the solution I want to come up with, the product that I need to define, who am I defining it for? And then you identify a persona. For me, I've been working on a product and I've been thinking across it, thanks to the Crossroads program. I am a, I am a young mother, so I relate it with my world and the change that I want to bring to the world. I am a young mom. Thank God I was not sold off for a few cows. I got, I got a kid at 16, yeah. So what is it that we can do as the insurance sector that will contribute to the uptake of more insurance, that is through insurance inclusivity, uh, penetration of insurance to areas that have not access to it. And how is it that I'm going to solve the challenges that young mothers face? So it's a win-win situation. So when I empathize, that means despite my biasness, I'll have to go back to the community, to the ground and check, listen to what the young mothers are going through. What are they, what am I hearing? What are they saying? What are they thinking? What are, what are the problems that they are facing without having coming up with a conclusion on myself? I can do this through one-on-one -on -one interviews, especially for young mothers in the remote sector. I can, I can do questionnaires for those, for those of us in the rural sector. After I empathize now, I have collected my data. Now the second step is defining. Defining is now where you come up with a problem statement. You want to be innovative, you want to come up with a solution. Now gather all those, all those thoughts that you got from them and all those that they had to say. And then now really understand what is the common problem? What are the challenges really facing these young mothers? From there, I think you can now gather insights on what you really want to work for. And then now goes the third step, which is ideation. This is now where real work happens. Ideation is now where you think, come up with those ideas. Think, think without limiting yourself. This is where you are allowed to explore your mind and use your peers and just try and come up with those solutions, those solutions that will really solve those problems. Uh, in, my, in my view, like if I give an example, I may come up with, I'm talking about insurance, uh, solving challenges faced by young mothers. 
So I really like this approach of using the, how might we do one and one and one to solve this? So you can ask yourself some questions. Maybe you have gathered that the young mothers, Dennis, you'll have to alert me on time. I talk a lot. <laughs> Okay, you can check maybe one of the problems that the young mothers are going through. They can't be able to run their daily operations. They, they, they have issues with their medical challenges. They have stigma. So when you're trying to come up with this solution, think of it this way. How might we, the insurance sectors, come up with that unique product apart from the conventional products that will be able to solve the challenges of this mother not touching their financial stability, ensuring that they run a day-to-day -day operations with ease. How is it that we can integrate their maternal and child needs of the mothers and ensure that these mothers get quality medical care? How can we eradicate stigmatization among young mothers by coming up with wellness and education programs through the insurance framework? How can we that ensure that these children have nutritional feed through insurance benefits and incentives? How can you ensure that the products that you are coming with will help the young mothers go to school, get education? And how can you ensure that they get maybe their daycare services so that they can go to school without thinking of how their kids are going through? So those are, it doesn't mean that all those that you're thinking about are solutions, but you're just rather trying to brainstorm, which if you come now to the fourth step, which is the prototype, is now where you will limit and focus on now the solutions that seem to work for you. And then now you come up, now the fifth step is now testing. The prototype doesn't have to be fully thought of or ever tested or having worked on all the time. Now you're testing your product to real human beings. And here you have to apply now the concept of the growth mindset. Go with an open mind. Is the product I am coming with, is it really giving real solution? Accept feedback. So when you accept feedback, you're gathering more insights. And when you gather more insight, it means that you may need to go back to the second step, which was the define. So you may tend to understand that the design thinking process is not a linear process. It's rather more of a cycle. Go and redefine your problem statement, come up with more ideas, try, try, try until you get that unique product that will solve the, the problem that you want to solve. And then uh, maybe if I finalize, I can talk more of thinking traps. The last few weeks I've been having this discussion and I did a blog on LinkedIn on thinking traps. What are these exactly? It's human for us to be very positive and want to come up with change. We want to be innovators, we want to drive change. But it is so human for us to have these negative thoughts. It's a pattern of negative thoughts. They're also called the thinking errors that come through your mind and tell you, Dennis, this one, it may be a bit difficult. There are five common thinking traps. One is called the mind reading. There's the me trap, the them trap. There's the catastrophizing. And there's a, a last one that is called the helplessness trap. Let me relate it to what I've been discussing about. Mind reading, for instance, I have come up with that idea. I have discussed with my peers. I'm now going to pitch to my supervisor. Then my supervisor does a positive, a constructive criticism about the product. You may be tempted to think, oh my God, she doesn't like it and that's the end of it. Kill your ideas at that step. The other one is the meat trap. Innovation is not easy. Coming up with products are not easy. You may come up with products that are not fitting the market so many times. So it's easy for you to give up and blame yourself. Them trap. You may get along the way and then you find it's not working and then you start saying it's because of my CEO, Karafa. Karafa did not do one, two, three. It's easy to blame others. The fourth one is the... Uh, catastrophizing. Your, your ideas have gone through so many processes and now they're at the top management level and then they get there and maybe you're given a feedback like we will think about it, we shall review and get back to you and that is the trap where you tend to think of the worst case scenario, oh my god that one is never working and uh, you, you can, it's easy, it's very easy to kill your innovation at that process. The fifth one is the helplessness trap where most of us are Insurance is at 3%. So it is in Kenya. It has been there for the longest time ever. What do I have to do with the 3%? There is nothing that can be done. And absolutely, I can't do anything towards it. If we go that route, then we shall never find a solution. The other way is to think, young mothers, they got themselves there. What does that got to do with me? I'm lucky. I'm supposed to be here. No. So yeah, I think I'm done. And it was very nice having this discussion. And I hope I haven't exceeded the time. But also my 
takeaway is as we think of the innovative solutions, let, let's, not, let's not go back. Make sure that the time you are on this world, you have made a positive change towards something. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Marcy, for that. Uh, you've covered quite a bit. And from my side, I've had entrepreneurship, I've had design thinking. I've had something around growth mindset and how we can be aware and build our awareness around the thinking traps that will enable us, rather that will hamper us to be able to uh, drive innovative solutions. I like the, the fact that the design thinking approach is also very cyclic. So I do not need to go on a one linear way. I can empathize as I ideate, as I prototype. And I believe this is something that is also very, very practical. And I hope that members of the audience will be able to see this uh, as they try to look into how they can use this particular tool to drive the changes that they are looking for. But also I'd like to, at this point, just to come back now then to Agoy Polycap. You are a business owner who runs a, a legal firm. Uh, with everything else that goes on, personally coming in, I wasn't considering, you know, uh, consultancy, especially from a legal field as entrepreneurship. But um, I have been able to redefine that uh, having interacted with you. And I think the next question that I would like to ask you, Polycap, is what are the key skills that you believe an entrepreneur needs to be able to drive innovation in their business? Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. And basically, what I, I appreciate uh, about entrepreneurship is actually you need every skill that you can get. Every skill comes to the test and actually is 2020 uh, this is in our third year and actually uh, before then I was working uh, in a corporate where I was in the legal department for about three years and actually both areas both uh, as an employee and also as an entrepreneur actually the skills that I learned at my start as a legal professional some of them I still carry them up to now as an entrepreneurship, as an entrepreneur. And therefore, I believe as an entrepreneur, you need all the skills that you can get. May it be even drawing well, is it proper communication? All skills can, can be used as an entrepreneur. However, based on today's topic and also my profession, and also based on my personal experience, I like to touch specifically on two skills, uh, which is uh, generally networking and collaboration. And also I'll talk about uh, system thinking as a skill that an entrepreneur uh, needs. And also I'll also uh, borrow so much from what I learned during my program, uh, Crossroad, where both skills were profoundly explained and also expanded. And we were given practical exam examples on how to utilize it. Now on networking and uh, collaboration, is, uh, as lawyers, of course, definitely, our area of practice in the last, I think, three years has undergone tremendous uh, changes, especially in terms of technology. Actually, uh, since COVID, I think you are the, the some of the best beneficiaries in terms of technology. Nowadays, we do our court matters while seated here in, in our offices. A uh, long time, you had to travel and physically go to court. Nowadays, like today, me, I had like three matters, which I've handled while well just in my office. One matter was in uh, in Nyeri, another one was in Thika, and another one was here in Nairobi. So if I was uh, uh, in the old age, I would have uh, maybe taken one matter, maybe I'd taken the one in Nyeri, send another advocate to uh, Thika, and another one to Milimani. However, I was able to do all of them here due to technology. And so that's an, an, an example of how change uh, uh, has happened. And so in, the, so, uh, in terms of uh, networking, we, when I started out, when I was leaving uh, my legal practice, Of course, an, as an entrepreneur, there's that aspect of you pay rent. You need a, a, a secretary. 
print. You need a table that had the other friend who had initially started. And therefore, the experience you of this all those things cost for tremendously to very fast. Uh, and I would be able to use this. Apologies for that. I think uh, Agui was experiencing a network shortage, but uh, as we wait for him to come back, a few things that I've picked up from his end are around networking, collaboration, and also uh, how he's been able to bring that in to the legal practice. Agoi, the last thing that you had from your end, uh, you had a bit of a choppy network, was around uh, how you've been able to bring in networking, particularly in your capacity as a legal entrepreneur. Maybe you can pick up from that. Yeah. So uh, that, yes, uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. I think there was a connectivity challenge, apologies. And uh, of course, networking and collaboration truly helped me towards that end. Now, while I was doing the crossroads, I was able to enhance this particular that I was able to look at you really need goal what to achieve and of it it is more intentional and more purposeful somebody but also how can you add value to them and of course you are taken through the process whereby you are able to uh of course basically through self-awareness what are your strengths uh what are you more uh inclined towards doing and then how can you be able to capitalize them when you're talking to to uh your people to people who you intend to network with and then secondly there was that aspect of identifying the people who you need to network with which are the group which are the individuals which are the organization do you want to network with or even collaborate with so that by the end of the day they can be able to build uh, your commute from your end and also you you can be able to leverage from their in order to build uh, uh, your weaknesses so that you can strengthen your weaknesses. The way uh, Marcy was talking, where you are able to identify these are the issues and how can you strengthen them in your in one way or another. So basically, identify, I'm able to analyze and also the people who are able to network. And therefore, I can be able to enable beneficial. It builds an aspect whereby it's more sustainable and also it's more long-term because somebody will not feel as if you are just a burden to them, but also you are adding value to them. And therefore, I'm able to do that. And also, secondly, in the legal profession, uh, networking and collaboration is our uh, funds. If a lawyer, an advocate, uh, wasting so much, not necessarily wasting, maximize on your resource, let's say like time and also money. Maybe just to give an illustration, our office is based here in Nairobi. We are at Nairobi. And maybe I have a client here in Nairobi who has purchased a property all the way in Mombasa. 
And so he wants me to do a due diligence on that property. In real sense, maybe I'll take that property, he'll give me a copy of his title and his documents, and take maybe um, a, a bus or maybe a, a SGR. Travel all the whole day, all the way to Mombasa, reach maybe in the evening, so the day is done. The next day, uh, I wake up very early, I go to the land office and do a land search. Then once I, maybe they tell me it will take a day or maybe two, and then I have to spend time there and then come back with the land search. But if you are able to network and collaborate in a, in a very mutual way, maybe you can make a call somewhere there in, to a colleague uh, in, in Mombasa, you call them, and you are able to agree on how they can assist you to do the search well in Mombasa. Therefore, you have saved your time and also your, your cost because you don't need to travel, you don't need to book uh, accommodation there. And it has an effect whereby you reduce your cost to yourself and also to reduce the cost to your client. And therefore you'll be, be able to pull in more clients because you have you charge less because you have found, uh, you have utilized your networks and your collaboration. And also you'll be doing it in a more timeful way. Because as my friend is doing my search or my due diligence in Mombasa, I'm able to concentrate in other work in Nairobi. And that's an example of the power of networking and collaboration and how it can be able to be utilized. Of course, you can look at even in a higher level whereby you can collaborate with other lawyers on legal issues and come up with new ideas as long as you are not monopoly uh, of knowledge in as much as we call ourselves the learned friends. Eh? But we are able to collaborate with people from different areas, our fellow colleagues, maybe we know this particular lawyer is good in this particular matter, and then we are able to exchange ideas. And when we meet our clients, we are able, we are well armed with the knowledge and skills. And of course, ultimately, we are called the learned friends because we came with uh, a lot of resources. So those are uh, examples of how collaboration and networking are in essential in entrepreneurship. And at least as far as I'm concerned for a lawyer because it's able to give you for uh, a, a, a field of more, a, a pool of expertise. You are able to cut on your cost and you're able at least to sustain yourself. And also lastly, maybe before I, I, I finalize on that issue of networking and collaboration, there's that issue of professional growth as lawyers because laws continuously change each and every day. And of course you have to keep this of what's going, growing in the legal profession, uh, what's new. And this is something that happens in everyday life uh, of a lawyer. Therefore, by networking and collaborating, you're able to go into circles whereby such discussions are going, whereby you meet people who are in different profession, and therefore you are able to learn. Therefore, to me, as a legal profession, and maybe other people who uh, uh, are in a similar profession like me, or maybe are inclined to a profession that's similar to me. That's why I value networking and collaboration. And maybe just to cast, to touch shortly on the other skill, which is system thinking. Uh, system thinking is one of the topics that was covered during my program at, at Crossroad. And basically it entails on, it arms you with a tool of problem solving. To me, basically, System thing is whereby rather than looking at a problem from the just as a problem, you are able to dig deeper into the root cause of a problem. What is the main cause of this problem? And uh, system thinking can be used at an individual level and also in your day-to-day -day engagement with a with a client. For instance, maybe at an individual level. Uh, and that was the example that was in a, one of the materials that we read was in terms of uh, time management. And that is what ultimately uh, tallies up to productivity. Let's say if you have 24 hours and even if you schedule your time very well, you do a to-do to -do list, of course, you'll have concentrated on only one issue, that is time. However, if you are able to look at it from a system thinking point of view, you look at it holistically, your 24 hours, you're able to consider things like not only time on your to-do list, you're able to consider things like your energy. Uh, and to me, that was the standing point. What's your energy? You have energy if you look at it as a tool. Of course, you'll have had your, had your to-do list, but do you have energy to do 
all of them very well. What are the activities in your to-do list? Can you uh, can you undertake that will conserve your energy or will be able to uh, maximize your energy? And energy is both uh, psychological and also physical. And to me, it was a great take up. And nowadays when I, uh, I do my to-do list, I look at aspects like energy. At what time will I go for my break? At what time will I wake up? At what time will I sleep? So that I can be able to look at the issue of productivity and time management holistically. And that's how I was able to, to stand it out at a personal level. I know my time is up. However, if you want to know more about uh, those issues of networking, system thinking, and how you can be able to maximize it, those other uh, those skills as an entrepreneur, you will be able, you can do the cross-road cross program and uh, we, we can also engage at a personal level whereby you can be able to talk more. Uh, thank you very much, Dennis. I know I used uh, more than the time you allocated, but thank you for uh, your indulgence. Thank you. Thank you, Agoy. Uh, you've shared quite a bit the key things that are stood up for me are around networking collaboration and how you've used that to strategically position yourself, even as a business owner and uh, someone who's in charge of driving the operations within your business, to be able to have access to vast opportunities not uh, withstanding the fact that you're in only a single location. You've been able to reach businesses uh, in the coastal region and any other spaces while you're still there. Also, it's the fact that you're able to even attend to your court matters that will be ideally, you know, see you move across various counties while still in the office just speaks to the fact that you know how to leverage technology to be able to do this. As an industry, I believe that is also a leg up because then that has given many people access the legal services that are uh, a need in this society. You also mentioned around systems thinking. How do we be? How do we approach problem solving from a long term perspective? It's not just about solving the problem here and now. Some of the things that are uh, problems that need us to solve require us to truly understand where we are coming from. And I can just tie that into what Masi shared at the beginning of the conversation around design thinking. Even as you go through that particular process, how do you come up with solutions that actually respond to the core of the challenges that you are trying to face? Thank you so much, Agoy, for sharing those insights. They have been truly valuable. And lastly, but not least, I would like to bring in Joseph Ferreiro into the conversation. Joseph, your expertise in talent and change consultancy uniquely positions you to speak to this last pillar of innovative leadership, which is around building an innovator's mindset. To kick us off, a question for you. Why do you think it is important for us to have an innovation mindset? Okay, thank you so much, Karafa, for the opportunity to share. So just to also recap what uh, the previous speakers have talked about, we are in a VUCA generation, so this means that things are rapidly changing. Uh, also, the amount of problems that we have, both as a society, in the organization, those problems are not reducing, they are actually increasing. And even in situations where we have solutions to those problems, sometimes we lack localized solutions. So we find that we have uh, a problem that maybe is in the West. And even as here in Africa, we are trying to solve it in the same way. But in true sense, we have different kinds of problems that need different kinds of solutions. And just to build a case that uh, the best solution for a problem is usually made by the person facing the problem. So this means that as Africans, we have the solutions to our own problems. So that brings me to the importance of an innovative mindset. We need to be able to solve our own problems. So I like uh, how Massey defined innovation as coming up with ideas to solve problems. And even for me, I define it as looking at existing situations and trying to make them better. So. I think it's very important. I'd also like to mention that innovation is different from invention. Uh, invention seeks to create something new that has never been, uh, been seen before. And I think in the world currently, there are very few inventions that are being made, but innovations uh, are a mix of already existing parts to create uh, new things. All right, uh, thank you for that. And I believe innovation versus invention is one of those differences that might uh, stop people from trying to adopt an innovator an innovator's mindset. Say, yeah. this has already been done. What am I supposed to do then? If 
financial knowledge is building up on that. What would you say are the key components of an innovator's life? Okay, so I'm going to draw on uh, I'm going to draw on a book or an article. It's called the Innovator's DNA. So in this book, uh, some researchers went sat down and talked to different uh, organizations, talked to different leaders and organizations that were considered to be innovative. So they sort of created an innovation index. And of course, one of the companies there was Apple because they are a company that is known for their innovations. And before I go far, I'd like to also reiterate what Masi had mentioned that there are different kinds of innovation. When you think of innovation, you think technology, that is process innovation, product innovation, service innovation, it can be divided into so many parts. And even the speed of innovation is usually different. So there could be a radical innovation. So this is an innovation that could transform an entire industry. Then there would be incremental innovations. This could apply for processes within uh, your organization. So you just improve them a little bit. Uh, so it's also important just to have that framework even as you're thinking uh, about innovation. So going back to the innovators DNA. So these researchers, uh, after doing this research, uh, speaking to different leaders, going to different organizations, they came up with a summary that innovators have uh, five key skills, which interestingly have even been mentioned to you the, uh, by, by the rest of the speaker. So this will be sort of a summary of even what we are saying uh, in terms of innovation. So one of the skills is one is questioning. Most innovators ask questions. They challenge the status quo in an organization, in their lives, in the world. They ask, why can't this happen? Um, I think it's the story of Henry Ford, where he said that uh, if, he, if, if he gave what people wanted in, in his age, he would have given them faster horses. But he asked different questions. He asked, uh, how, do, how do we move faster? So it's, it's also stripping down questions to, um, so, 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 so just to give an example, for example, I, I'm sure some of us are still waiting for flying cars. But in my perspective, the flying car already exists. It's called an aeroplane. And it's because it's, it's about the function, it's about the problem you're trying to solve. The problem is travel through air. So innovations also look like different things. So, so just make sure that questioning is a key skill in innovation, being willing to ask the hard questions, being willing to ask the right questions. Because I think also we come from a society where we want to go towards pr problems with answers first, instead of taking a little bit of time asking the correct questions. So here the skill of asking the five whys come, becomes very important that for you to get to the root of a problem, sometimes you just need to ask why, why, why until you get to the root of the problem. So the second skill is observing. Most innovators observe a lot. They observe behaviors. They look for behavioral details in activities of customers, suppliers, the organization to gain insights or new ways about doing things. So they also observe in different fields. So let's say I'm a consultant, I go to maybe the legal profession and sit with Polycap for one day and just observe how they work. I can come up with new ideas for my field as a talent acquisition uh, sort of specialist because of just that level of, of, of observation. Also, I'm sure you can now see observation and questioning becomes even a more powerful tool used uh, together. The third skill is networking. And I think uh, Polycap has also touched on that, is that innovators don't create alone. The network through their networks, they are able to find ideas. Through their networks, they're able to validate the ideas or uh, even learn different things. So, for example, what we are doing currently here, uh, people from different professions coming to share ideas, we are able to learn from each other. And maybe that's all that you need to have the aha moment in something that you need uh, to build. So, for example, I like to say like the field of artificial intelligence uh, borrows a lot from biology. Neural networks in artificial intelligence almost function the same as neural networks in biology. So you can see that uh, through observation, questioning, networking, probably it took someone who has done computer science to meet with someone who has done biology, new things happen. New ideas uh, often show up when people from different fields meet and discuss. And then the other skill is experimenting. So um, I think also must touch on this in terms of design thinking where you have prototypes. So it means that when you, once you have a new idea, you experiment. So most often, even in most organizations, even most startups who have started, did not start with the original idea. They started with a different kind of idea. 
and then they kind of built it up. They kind of, they kind of built it up or rather pivoted to where the need was. So they thought maybe the problem was X, but after they started experimenting, they realized that their customers were responding to a different kind of uh, what they had created. And interesting companies now decide to double down on that. So I think from a reading, I, I've learned like, like big tech companies like Amazon, Google, I think they just have experiment teams who run like hundred experiments at the same time, just small experiments to make this better, shift this icon to this side, just to see uh, what is going to come out of it. And then last but not least, uh, innovators are good associators. So in doing all these, they have already collected lots of data, collected a lot of information. They sit down and associate this information, put it together, one, to solve a problem that they have or to solve a problem that they have seen. And two, is just to find the connections between these different areas. Because where now the connections are, where things that are seemingly unrelated, questions, problems, ideas, this skill is, uh, is key for an, an, an innovator. So an innovator does not try to be an inventor. An innovator tries to research the best that they can towards the problem they have. They try to curate all the information. And then they sit down with it and ask themselves, so what, what can I do uh, with this information? So an example uh, of association is the, you, you know, these luggage bags that we carry to the airport with wheels. So interestingly, bags have been invented way early. Wheels have also been invented, but it only took one person to think, what if I combine the two? And maybe I'll solve a bigger problem here. So they just combined two items that are already there and they came up with something new. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that uh, very specifically. I like the, the, you know, the bag on wheels kind of illustration and I mean, Right now, it looks very intuitive. It looks like, well, if you just have done that, but to think there's a big generation there that do not have this, the ability to question, to observe, to network, to be willing to experiment and also ask the questions and so what? What do I bring else? What else can I, what are some of the things I have observed that I can bring together? And I like also the distinction that you placed around innovators are not necessarily inventors. And so that, gives most of us an opportunity to actually go out there and innovate because invention is hard. I think uh Agoy, maybe you can you can uh, speak to the fact that in the copywriter's office a lot of people go there and they're told ah this one this one was already there actually it was done 10 years ago and so the question is what can what else can you do with the resources that you have final question to you Joseph and this is getting a bit personal from your end how have you utilized the innovator's mindset to drive sustainable change in the places that you work? And also, particularly, how did the Lapid Crossroads program help you in building up that muscle? Okay, thank you so much for that question. So in terms of utilizing the innovator's mindset, I have found that questioning comes very early in the innovator's process because an innovator is trying to answer a question to a problem that they have seen. So early on in my career, I joined uh, my current organization in 2019. And uh, when I was hired as, as a project intern, I was, given a, I was given a project. And I remember taking a lot of time asking questions because uh, the, the, what I was solving for was sort of, we needed to have a more seamless process in managing recruitments within the organization. And I think what I asked, so I, I asked several questions. So what are we solving for? What is the problem? So some of the problems were we cannot uh, retrieve applications fast enough, not able to search for applications fast enough, not able to communicate to candidates fast enough. And having a list of those problems and also just observing the current process. Because remember that innovation comes to already a process that exists. The problem you're trying to solve is already being solved with a different in, in a different method. So you need to appreciate how everybody is used to solving that problem. Uh, so I think after that observation, I decided that uh, I, I tried a bit of solutions. So uh, my, background, my background is in computer science. So I, I tried to create some solutions, some customized solutions, but they, 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 did, they, they did not work. They answered, the question, they answered some questions, they did not answer some questions. So uh, part of it, I did some networking. I started talking to people. What do what do recruitment companies use to solve such problems? 
because something I've learned is that if you have a, pro a problem is you, you're not the only one with the problem. I think I, I've learned that from my background in, in computing or programming. If you have a problem, someone else had it and solved it. So find them so that you can also solve uh, your problem. So that way I was able to realize that there are actually tools called applicant tracking system that can be from off the shelf or customized. And so in a sense, I used that route now to research more. Uh, so I opened up my research, tried to find every possible solution to the problem. And eventually I was able to come up with a solution to the problem that we, have, that, that we were facing. So that's how I've been able to use all those things, observation, questioning, association, networking, just to be able to come up with a solution within the workplace. So in terms of how the Crossroads program has impacted me, I think the Crossroads program opened me up to, uh, it opened me up to thinking at a different level. So remember those are, um, I may not remember the exact term, but in today's world where there are multiple polarities, multiple views, uh, we find it very hard to hold two opposing ideas at the same time. We find it hard to, we, we find it easy to pick a side instead of battling with ideas that seem to be contradicting. And I think I've come to learn that in life, in professionally, that most, the solution to most problem is not either or, it's both. It's and depending on the context. So I think that's a one key skill that I really learned from uh, Crossroads program. I had also talked about mindset earlier. I think it was very important for me because I, I learned that our brains have sort of neural pathways towards the habits that we have right now. And through information, through the change that we seek to make, we could, we, we could shift. I think we, we called it neuroplasticity, how your brain can really change how it thinks and how you do things. So I think that really helped me in terms of when I face challenges at work, I tell myself, maybe my brain is not ready right now. I need more information, <laughs> I need more practice, and I'm going to be able to shift my thinking to face this problem in a better way. Oh, fantastic insights there, Joseph. I like the fact that even as you are looking through the illustration that you've shared uh, in your own experience, I, I picked that this is actually something that I can do on the day, you know? It, it, I, I, do not need to, I do not need to sit somewhere in a lab to be able you know, uh, maybe to hire the big four consultancy firms to be able to do this. You said even it, as you're going through this particular challenge, you are at the inter uh, intern level within the organization that right now you serve as a team lead. Also with the background, you know, how do I bring the knowledge that I have to shape my perspectives in this particular problem? You drew quite a bit from your background in tech to be able to solve this particular issue within the talent management space. And I can talk to so much more that you have shared with us, but I know that we are running towards the close of this uh, session. And first and foremost to our audience, I apologize that this has been able, not been able to go live on LinkedIn. Uh, the stream broke at some point, but we are recording it and we'll be able to share a recording uh, by our YouTube channel. That being said, to Marcy, to Joseph, to Agui, thank you very much for showing us what are the tools, what are the skills, and what is the mindset that we need to be able to drive change as innovators as innovators, not, not, only, not only innovators, but leaders who embody an innovation mindset. And today's conversation has been drawn from some of the modules that have been covered within the Crossroads program, as you've heard from our panelists. And so if you're a professional keen on driving change in your organization, keen on creating a culture of high performance in yourself and in your team, as you've heard from our boy, then you should sign up for the Crossroads program with a September intake kicking off at the 2nd of September. You can get started by completing the application form that we shall be sharing uh, within our social media spaces. And to summarize out, we've been able to explore the various tools, the skill sets, the mindsets that are necessary for us to be able to drive change within organizations to enable us to sustain our businesses in a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous business. Remember, innovation is nothing but the bridge to a successful future. And with the right tools, with the right skills, and with the right mindset, we can navigate even the most challenging of landscape. I want to express my gratitude to all our speakers, Maximo Moy, Agoy Polikap, and Joseph Arroyo, for sharing their expertise in the various spaces that they work in, and bringing those perspectives, helping us to foster innovation in the spaces that we currently serve. 
Thank you all for our audience for joining us in this very informative discussion. And I wish that you may stay strong. You may stay agile. Keep innovating, stay curious, and invest. With that, I would like to wish you all a fantastic afternoon and a great weekend ahead. To our panelists, I'd like for us to unmute and wish our audience a good afternoon. Goodbye. Hello, everyone. <laughs> okay, you can go. Okay, thank you, all of you who took your time to listen to us. We apologize for the LinkedIn breakdown, but that didn't stop us. We will share the YouTube uh, videos. And also for me, I think I'll be sharing more insights on the LinkedIn through the LinkedIn posts. My, I have discovered my purpose and I want to bring a change to the world. Thank you all. Thank you, Marcy. Joseph, closing remarks. Uh, I want to thank everyone who attended this session. Uh, and I'd also like to say that uh, also follow me on LinkedIn, follow me on Twitter for more insights. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. I'm going. You're on mute. Ah, thank you very much. I was talking to myself, but otherwise I'm very more than happy to be uh, here. And thank for all who logged in to listen to us. Uh, I look forward to us for the engagement. And I hope you all sign so that you could, we shall all meet at Crossroad Program, at least when you join and when you graduate. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That brings us to the end of our session. I bid you all a farewell and a great weekend. Okay. Feel free to drop off from the session. And I will also be sharing the links to the various social media pages for our panelists for you to be able to engage with them even beyond today. Asante Nisana, for area.